And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Jeremy McDonald, author of two Amazon international bestsellers, along with 25 years as a public speaker, coach, intuitive guide, and quantum healer. In 2012, a pivotal moment in Jeremy's life occurred when he had a shared near-death experience with his mother, which set Jeremy on an extraordinary path that spans several years as he processed this beautiful experience. Jeremy, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for, thank you for having me on the show and uh, excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you. <laughs> Let's start on the day that you had that shared death experience and go from there. Yeah, absolutely. My, uh, it was uh, January 9th of 2012 and, uh, and just mom had had uh, uterine cancer. She was a, uh, um, she, you know, I mean, you can just imagine the amount of emotions and all that kind of stuff. And she was a hospice nurse. So it was really interesting because we were actually in the hospice that she was, uh, she had worked at. And uh, I was sleeping on the couch that morning and I had, uh, well, I had slept next door holding her hand that night, you know, like any son or, you know, family member would to support their, be, you know, give that uh, support to that loved one. And just spend those last moments with her. And so I got up in the middle of the night, probably like five, about four or five in the morning, moved to the couch and went to sleep. And it was really interesting. I fell asleep and then I just felt this. I, the best way to describe it is I kept on getting this feeling like, you know, that moment when you're a teenager and your mother's knocking on the door to tell you to get up to go to school, you know, that, and you're like, ah, leave me alone. I'll get up here in a second. I'm sure everybody can relate to this. And I'm like, you know, let me, you know, just let me be. Well, I kept on hearing this door knock and it was, I walked out and opened the door and it was her uh, assistant. And uh, she had, uh, she says, I just want to say goodbye to your mother. She comes in, she says goodbye. And I, I just remember I had that eerie feeling like my mother had been talking to me saying, it's time for you to get up here. It's time for you to get up. If you want to say goodbye, it's time to say it now. <laughs> so I held her hand and I said goodbye and uh, gave her a hug. And it was um, kind of interesting because then I went and laid back down to go to sleep. And probably about 30 minutes later, I literally felt my energy, just my body kind of lift up out of my body is the best way to put it. And when I, this happened, they had, had, they had flowers everywhere in this, in this room and the streamers on the wall. And, um, and so then I started hearing the streamers start hitting the wall. I guess the you know those little paper streamers I hear it, clack 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 and it's like you know it's just weird because streamers shouldn't make those kind of noises and nothing should make them do that <laughs> and so um, I had this just a uh, sense of peace and as I'm pulling up out of my body and then somebody touches my shoulder it was one of the nurses and said uh, Mr McDonald your your mother has passed and so I got up. And in that moment, you would have thought I would have been completely devastated, but I had this sense of peace. And I remember I was in the middle of writing my book at that time. <laughs> so um, I had uh, walked in and I was brushing my teeth and kind of getting ready and just kind of processing the fact that, you know, my mother had just uh, passed away. And I, I started thinking, well, mom, you're not going to be able to, you're going to miss out on this book that I just, you know, and I'm sorry, you're not going to see this. And I literally heard Jer, I, I taught you everything in that book. And, you know, I, I already know what you wrote. And I was like, you know, and I've been around this world for a while. So it was, it was interesting that it surprised me, but it was, I'd never had anything that kind of experience. And so I went on and probably a week later, um, we had her memorial and that was an interesting experience all in itself where I had worked at the time for MetLife. And uh, I had uh, had an outside memorial because she always said, I want to be have my memorial be a celebration of life. I want it to be by water. Um, she really loved uh, being by the ocean. So we had it uh, or by a river or a lake. It didn't really matter. So we had her memorial right at the river uh, where I lived. And the MetLife blimp flew over the over her uh, picture over the memorial and hovered there for a good hour. And I remember people were asking me, did you plan that? Because you work for MetLife. I'm like, I absolutely did not plan for the MetLife blimp to fly over my mother's memorial. 
And I remember uh, I, I had a series of just interesting synchronicities going on for a good six months to a year after she passed away. But that very next day, I'm in the shower getting ready. You know, I still have family around uh, because they'd come down to visit and, you know, be supportive. And I felt her energy step inside of my body. And it was just really interesting. I, I don't know if, if anybody has ever had the experience of lo losing all anxiety, all pain, all, um, how do I describe it, just complete peace in the body. You know how you always have this, like you woke up on the wrong side of the bed and you got tension in your muscles, all that was gone. And it, I felt like it lasted for an eternity. And she said, when she stepped into my body, she said, this is what heaven feels like. And so, and you know, you just have, it's the best way to describe it, I think in human terms is you're a drop in the ocean. And, and as a drop in the ocean, you can feel that sway of the ocean and how easily it moves and back and forth. And you can hear the waves and all that other kind of stuff. And that just pure bliss and relaxation. And it was such an incredible experience because like I said, I felt like it lasted an eternity and uh, it probably lasted about 10 or 15 seconds to be quite honest with you, but it lasted, it felt like it lasted a very long time. And I remember thinking I was so excited. I was like, mom, we have to get everybody I know. And sorry, I started thinking about family members and friends. And I said, they all have to feel this energy. Can you give this to them? And I heard, no, Jer, they're not ready. It's not time for them. It's not time for them to experience this. And they're not open. Not everybody's open to having their mother step into, <laughs> my mother step into their body. So it took me a while to really process that. I mean, I could tell story after story after story of people coming up to me and saying, I swear to God, I had a dream about your mother last night and she uh, told me such and such, or I went to a medium and uh, in that interaction or that whatever you want to call it reading, uh, they said, they're, they, they said, you know, this is a person that didn't even know my mother. Um, it was a friend of my mother's or the medium didn't know me or my mother. And it would say, you had a friend pass away recently with their, their first initial starts with L and they're, they have a son and their, their initial starts with J. And so this is a person that doesn't know me. And so it was really, why is that super important? It's important to know because as much as I had been in this world, I knew it here. I knew that we go somewhere after up beyond death, but I don't, uh, I didn't necessarily know it here in the heart. And so when you have people telling this going on for like months afterwards and these incidents that kind of give you the same, the idea of knowing where people go, that they do go somewhere else. And it was, I didn't even know what I had experienced uh, right after her, after, during her death and the feeling of raising up out of my body until somebody at her memorial came up and said, hey, you know, you really need to go to this conference next month and uh, Raymond Moody is going to be here. And I'm not going to lie to you, Jeff, I didn't know who Raymond Moody was at the time. And so I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. And uh, it was somebody, a social worker that had worked with my mother at hospice. And she says, no, you really need to go. There's a really, I feel like you're going to really gain something from going. So I went and I, I met him and I had a podcast at the time. And it was funny because I had uh, asked him, I had told him my experience. And he goes, well, it sounds like you had what was called a shared death experience. And he had wrote one book about shared death experiences and it was back in the 90s. And so I bought that book and I read about it. And there's several experiences of family members feeling the same feeling of being raised up out of their body. When he was in medical school, uh, one of his professors came up to him and asked him about her experience. Well, she was, uh, she was a doctor and she was giving uh, CPR to her parent and she was raised up out of her body. And uh, she didn't understand this phenomenon. She thought it was weird. She's a medical doctor. This is in the seventies. She's like, what happened to me? And he goes, at that time, he didn't know because he had only wrote his first book when he was a, a philosophy major and then went into his MD program and he had studied this phenomenon. But through the years, he kept on looking at that phenomenon. So that started to give me, leave me with more questions. And so, you know, that's great. I had this experience, but what's the point? <laughs> you know, why did, you know, I get a few seconds of pure bliss. And then why do we people come back here? Because she had had a an experience, a near-death experience. She had a near-death experience two years prior when she had a heart attack. 
And then she came back for me because she had a choice. Her experience was an angel came to her and says, you can either come with me or you can come back. And she said, well, I need to come back because Jeremy needs me. And so what that started to tie to tell me is that we as individual human beings, even our souls have an attachment or a tethering, so to speak. And yes, there is a plan, so to speak, but it was her, her need as a mother to come back and make sure her son was taken care of. And it wasn't until, you know, I, she, then she got sick a few years later and I said to her, um, you know, if you need to go and you don't want to be here anymore, it's okay for you to go. And that's something she had taught me as a hospice nurse. She said, a lot of times uh, family members will stick around because they want to make sure that their their family is okay. And so then it just kind of led me down a path. I mean, I've had some experiences where uh, uh, somebody that didn't even know her uh, called me up and said, hey, what are you doing tonight? And I said, um, you know, I'm going out with some friends. And they said, cancel it. I had a dream about your mother last night, and she wants me to buy you a Christmas present. And uh, the Christmas present was a painting of Archangel Michael. And I had been having dreams and worn Archangel Michael necklaces since I was probably a teenager. And just because I thought the story behind Archangel Michael was always really cool and the metaphysical reasons that, you know, who he was and what, you know, St. Michael was and all that kind of stuff. So there's no way this woman could have known that I had that connection to Archangel Michael. And so, was, you know, you could kind of chalk it up for being, hey, somebody had a dream about your mother, you know, great. But she didn't know my mother <laughs> and she didn't know that about me. So and that's just kind of uh, that's kind of the experience. But it's really, to be honest with you, the story is great um, to me. Um, I've told it. I have a friend who wrote a book about it, you know, put, included me in her book. But it really, to me, what's more important is what I got from that feeling and what I think all of us can, you know, really understand. And so. I just really started to think that, you know, it starts in the heart here and how we look at the world, that feeling of being part of the ocean really is about life and about how, you know, they say live in the flow, so to speak. You know, that sounds like such a cliche statement, but it really has to do with we act on the moments and the inspiration and the opportunities that we have in our lives. And what we always look back at and judge ourselves, so to speak, like me wanting to have my friends and family have this feeling that she was giving me, but that would affect their own plan or their own life path, so to speak, because maybe they weren't ready for that or it wasn't time for them or whatever. And so uh, that codependent part of me, I want them to have this feeling um, could steal from them their, their experience. And that's not okay either. And so there's just a lot of things I've processed and, you know, I, I do love all the, the fun phenomenon that you kind of go, you can't make this stuff up and kind of giggle about it. But I really enjoy the fact that, you know, you, we can look at our life and start to say, it doesn't have to be as stressful as we make it out to be. It's going to be, life is, can be very simple. And through the past 11, you know, years, so to speak, I'm getting to be almost 12 years, I've started to look at my relationships and the, the friendships and the people I had in my life and speaking up and, you know, those kind of things, because, you know, really a lot of times we hold on to things that we don't need to, and I can go into more detail of that, but it's just, yeah, that's kind of the beginnings of the, the, the experience <laughs> of the shared death experience. Uh, did I fly on wings like uh, uh, other people did? No, but it was, a, it was that freedom, that sense of freedom that I got in that moment. It's fascinating that your mother was a hospice nurse before she went into hospice. I'm pretty sure that she had seen some extraordinary phenomena happen as a hospice mm -hmm. nurse. Did she ever relay any of that to you? Yeah, she actually did. One of the coolest parts of uh, she two, two experiences that I know for sure, this is how she knew where she was going. I mean, she had... Uh, she had watched a lady, literally, she saw the energy of her stepping out of her body and the soul actually coming out of the body. And she was so like overwhelmed as she was like, what we believe in is real. And, you know, she'd seen that more than once. She goes, not necessarily that to that much detail, but she had seen them step out of the body. And one of the things that happens like with a lot of people that are passing away, they start doing this gibberish 
type of thing where they're like talking to people that aren't there. And so I had known that because she did it. And then also um, she had talked about that. But the other phenomenon, when I mentioned people hang out, is she had had a lot of patients that were over the age of 100. 100. And she had this one lady, I think she was about 107 or 108. And her her son was in his 80s, late 80s. And he kept on saying, mom, don't you want to hang out with me a little bit longer? And she'd say, okay, I'll stay a little longer. So she was literally holding up, but she thought God had forgotten about her. And, and so she was tired, you know, 100 and over 100 years. At that point, she had lived through the turn of two centuries, which is phenomenal. But uh, yeah, she had a, a lot of stories when I think that's what prepared her for our transition because she knew where we were going. And what I really think is very interesting is, you know, hospice is such a wonderful, wonderful um, group of people, I guess, is the, way, the best way to put it, because they're literally helping people transition onto the other side with dignity and that kind of stuff. But fast forward, maybe, well, into 2020, my uh, one of my best friends, he his mother was transitioning. And uh, so we went up to Georgia to see her and she was doing the same exact thing that I already knew. She was starting to talk in that kind of gibberish and that kind of stuff. And, you know, she was talking to her family on the other side. And I leaned in and I said, that's because your family is here. Your dad is here. Everybody is here. And they are here to make sure that she knows that she's loved and it's okay for her to take that step onto the other side. And so, and because I'd have the experience of, you know, the shared NDE, I knew that it wasn't a harmful or hurtful place. It was very loving presence. And it was a place where she wasn't gonna have any anxiety. So I was able to help my friend through this experience. And I've helped, been able to help a lot of other people as a result of just kind of sharing my story and saying, this is, I know for a fact where they go. There is no doubt in my mind that there is a life beyond this and it's not now it's not in the head anymore it's in the heart and that's really where you really start and it's interesting most people have these experiences i know everybody understands this where your relatives on the other side and uh, you'll kind of smile and think about the memories you had and maybe a time when you were laughing or a christmas or a thanksgiving or whatever good memories that pop up that means they're thinking about you on the other side and they feel that love that you have in your heart at that moment. So if you ever wanna connect with loved ones, it's usually through that. And so it's, in, you know, like I have, I have friends that they say, every time I see a feather, it reminds me of my dad or my mom because of such and such experience. And then they smile. Or every time I, you know, I, I make banana pudding because every year for my, my, my birthday, my mother made banana pudding and chicken and dumplings for me because that was my favorite thing. And so, you know, that's when they say that our, our relatives are still in our heart. We're also energetically still attached to them at some level because, you know, this we are separate, but we're also one, so to speak. And that's, a, that's something that I really felt when it's kind of like that drop in the ocean. You're still you, but you're a part of that ocean. So, and your family members are still a part of that uh, that are still a part of that ocean, but you're just experiencing on a different level and a different level of consciousness. And so that's really where, yeah, lots of experiences that she gave me and a lot of things that she taught me. But really, honestly, I'm not gonna lie, I started listening to her more on the other side than I did up here. Like most sons don't listen to their mother. Um, you know, they love her, love their mothers, but I used to tell her she got dumb about 13 and got smart again when I turned 30. <laughs> It's because I started listening again. So. so have you thought about what realm is she in? Is she kind of like in our realm, in the astral, or does she go to other dimensions? Or, or what do you think? Well, there is a, I think one of the best ways to explain this is, you know, if you have like a, a water bottle, you know, like just the normal water bottle we drink out of, um, those plastic ones that come in the 24 case bottles or whatever, it doesn't really matter, a can of Coke or a bottle of Coke. The difference between the realms of dimensions that we're at and they're at is the difference between the space of the water and the bottle. So it's such a fraction of a space, but I think they're separated by frequency, meaning that's why we can't see them or feel them. Um, and the ones that, you know, like a lot of times we can see our parents or people that are on the other side, but we're not necessarily 
we don't do that professionally. Well, that's because we're closer to them and that energy. But we can call them in anytime we want them. If we need help or anything like that, they can come in. So to answer your question, um, yeah, I do believe in different realms of consciousness. But I think another great way to uh, just, uh, to show this is to look at the movie. I and mean, this is going to sound very cliche, but the movie, The Scarlet Witch, where she's kind of connected and can see the different parts of the multiverse. And they're like little dots of experience of her, of her different uh, parts of who she was. I, but they're, it's all interconnected. And or even Alex Gray's paintings. He has uh, paintings called the Universal Lattice Mind, if anybody's ever heard of that you can see the interconnected of the frequency. So they're not in this flesh, so to speak, but they're in freak, they're a frequency. And so we're connected by light or frequency or, and stuff like that. And you as a human body are frequency as well. Like scientists have actually shown that we our body vibrates at 42 octaves above third space C. So if that's the case, then that means you're a frequency. You're just at a denser frequency than your relatives on the other side. And so, um, yeah, they're in a realm, but it's not it's not hard for them to connect with us very fast because it's all done through frequency. Another part of your story that I find fascinating is your mother's ability to influence different people through their dreams. Yeah. 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 So that was it, it was it was really interesting to me, that experience. Um, but interesting enough in life, she would get these dreams and then they would happen you know, maybe a year or two, she didn't necessarily have the timeline, but she would have these dreams. And then a year or two later, or uh, six months later, we'd be experiencing exactly that. So it doesn't surprise me that in, in life or in the spiritual realm, she would come to people in dreams. And so um, she even, I've even had experiences where I've, you know, I've had a dream where she comes and we spend, it doesn't happen too often here and there. I think when she knows that I need her or I've been missing her. <clears throat> I've had experiences where we were driving around going to all of our favorite places in Tampa, going to the, our favorite breakfast spot, going to our favorite bookstores. My mother loved books and uh, really just kind of having those experiences. And um, it's usually right around the time I'm having a hard time. You know, I'm really trying to process something and I needed that kind of motherly love. And I don't care, their parents say to us, you know, you're always going to be my child, so to speak. But as a child, we still want our parents' love, you know, and when, when they're not around, we miss them. And uh, and it's okay. That's one thing I had to deal with is that it's okay for the human side to miss people, even if you know where they're at. So the, the ego goes into, well, why are you why are you grieving if if you know where they're at? Well, your human side, you have to allow your human side to have experienced those emotions. And to deny those is really harmful to you so um yeah so I, i've had quite a few experiences where she's uh, come to visit people in their dreams or i had one uh person that didn't even know her and said uh you know i had this experience with this woman she has uh blonde hair um <laughs> you know or and she had kind of like this dirty blonde hair that kind of stuff and like hazel eyes just like me and they were like and she was just uh comforting me you know, just kind of making me feel at peace. And then I had another experience where a friend of mine was getting eye surgery. She had had a stroke several months beforehand. And this was just a, about a week or two after she passed away. Um, and they said, uh, you know, your mother came to me during my surgery and held my head and started singing to me and described uh, described my mother. You know, she had this look on her face and her hair was like this. And her eyes, it was her eyes that really made me know it was her. And then she said, it's Lori. She goes, I only met your mom maybe one time uh, when she was alive. So it was really kind of uh, different for me. And she says, why are you singing to me? And she goes, well, my friend was a singer. Um, and she said, you sing for everybody else. I thought it was time for you to have somebody sing to you when you were going through such a hard time, you know, this, this surgery she was going through. And then she says, tell Jeremy that it's in the water and it's a blue mermaid dress that I'm wearing. And I thought that was, at first I was like blue mermaid dress. And then, but it was when she said it's in the water and I just had that experience like a week or so beforehand where I felt like it was dropping the ocean. And so I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. Well, I didn't think too much about that until a year later, I was um, 
at my friend's studio that had never met my mother. And she had a painting of a woman uh, that just exactly like my friend had described uh, in a blue dress that was flowing like it was like a blue mermaid dress and the exact same eyes, exact same hair color and everything. And then another friend of mine that lived down in um, down in the Keys, she said, I was telling her that story. She goes, it's interesting. I, I drew a mermaid uh, literally a month after your mother passed away with a blue outline, this uh, same type of hair, same type of eyes. And I, she goes, I would totally give it to you, but I sold it at a fantasy fest last month. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, that's really cool. And so there's this kind of metaphysical or spiritual experiences that just keep on happening. And it's one of those things, that, especially for the first couple of years, you know, now over the few years, it doesn't happen as often because I don't necessarily need that validation or confirmation of where she's at. But it is, um, it is one of those things where you start to go, oh, okay. And uh, then you have to, then you kind of think you're crazy a little bit at first, because you're like, am I really imagining this or am I just trying to hold on to my mother? But when they, it gets backed up with different things that you research and different stories and things that people didn't even know who she was and describe who she was as a person. Yeah, that, that starts to make you go, oh, okay. Well, then maybe you really did have an experience with her coming. And uh, so it, it, that, that, really to me for me i just thought it was really a, an opportunity for me to know uh where people are at and so and then have that experience of what i could grow into um from that and what i kind of learned is that this body and this vessel they say in the bible it's a temple so to speak but it's also a flow of energy that goes through it and so one of the things that i started experiencing and feeling from her she'd say what I want you to start doing, um, I'm sorry, I'm a little off topic here, but what I want you to start doing is just breathe, take deep breaths in your in your body. And when you take these deep breaths, I want you to feel all your tension and all your anxiety and all those things that are causing the block of flow within you. Much like in a, uh, in a river, when you have a big rock in the middle of the river, the water goes around it. So those knots and those anxieties or that uh, mild, that fascia in your body that's all knotted up and kind of stuff, if you just start breathing, and these this is yoga principles when you really think about it, and then you stretch, and then you start allowing those things to start surfacing within your mind and your consciousness. Because like um, traumas or anything that's happened in our life, it's like a beach ball underwater. Eventually, it's going to come out. And what she was trying to show me is that all that stuff is what's blocking you from that flowing feeling. All those uh, times where somebody made you feel bad about yourself. All those times you looked in front of the mirror and said, I'm not good enough. All those uh, times you didn't take that leap of faith and you really could and you missed out on opportunities. All those times that you had an idea and you didn't act on it because you didn't think that you had what it takes or you didn't have enough to, to, to move forward. All that's stored in the body. And it's an energy that's stored in the body. And when you start taking the deep breaths in, you're not only relaxing the body, but you are also trying to get an assessment of where your blocks are at. And so people are always saying, well, how do I find my blocks in my body? And how do I find the blocks in my energy field? Well, so the energy field is basically that ocean, so to speak. And you are that drop within the ocean. And so, and your, your job is to be in flow with that ocean and allow your life to go where you need to go. So, but the ego will say stuff like, well, wait a second. If I'm just going to be in flow, how am I not going to, how am I going to pay for my bills? How am I going to do for all of this? It doesn't mean you're not acting on things. You're acting on the inspiration or the opportunities that are coming to you. And so, you know, I didn't know two weeks ago I'd be on your show, but it was just one of those things where it was an opportunity that came and you act on it. And so these are the things that in, what I would invite people that are watching to start looking at is saying, how many opportunities did you miss out on because you were unwilling to allow yourself to go into that flow or take that step forward? And so that's one of the things that that energy started to show me is that I had missed out on a lot of opportunities. I was always careful and I was always, you know, I had a fascination with, you know, the things that you talk about on your show, I had a fascination, I'd studied that for many, many years, but why wasn't I not taking those step forwards to follow what I already knew? And, you know, and so it's really interesting when you start looking at that, and then then you start looking at um, 
you know, the stress that's in your body because we're not speaking up or we're not acting on things. And um, all those opportunities are still stored in your body. And then if you get into the energy, energy system, that's a whole other topic. Uh, they're actually just lessons. Like when people talk about chakras and stuff like that, your throat chakra is your lesson of speaking up and living in your truth uh, and being empowered because it's your it's your power chakra. You know, the heart is obviously, you know, that experience of the governor of the center of all of that. Um, the third eye is what what you're not seeing. If it's if you're not seeing things before the red flags and in situations, then it's because this is blocked up. And uh, the solar plexus is that connection to other people and spirits. And so, um, you know, if that's closed up because you don't trust anybody, then you're bringing more experiences in your life of not, you know, people that are not trusting, you know, and they, they continue to betray you over and over again. They say that that with which you resist persists. Well, that's exactly what happens. And so, um, and it really just starts by being quiet and really starting to breathe in your body and I just ask every night, this is something that she taught me in spirit. I said, show me what I'm not seeing today or my missed opportunities today. And so I just start to review the day. Was there a missed opportunity? Did I miss out on something? And it's not about guilt or beating yourself up. It's about saying, hey, where could I grow as a person and experience my life differently? And so, uh, and I know we can all relate to this because we've all had these experiences. This is nothing new. <laughs> You know, but it's one of those things that th that's what that experience taught me is that we can have heaven on earth here, um, but we get tied up. And a lot of my clients are people that are in professions. I have a lot of people in the um, different professions that uh, will come to me and they're like, I'm so sick of what I'm doing. I'm like, well, what is it you'd like to do? But they're so afraid to take that step forward. And I'm like, all you have to do is take the step forward. It, I'm not saying leave behind this behind right away. I'm just saying take a step forward, you know, and things will start to unfold in their life. And you'll start to see them kind of make mistakes. And, you know, they're afraid to make a mistake. And that fear is that energy caught up. And I had to break it to people. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to um, we're going to make a plan where it's not going to it's not going to turn out the way we want it to. I went on a book tour uh, very shortly after my mother passed away. Um, I decided I wanted to go to all the states that she and I wanted to go to, um, and I just made it my book tour, too. And so um, went to Taos, New Mexico, and all these things that my mother and I had dreamt about doing our entire life, because she and I had always talked about traveling. And uh, when I was 18 years old, she wanted to move to California as a traveling nurse for a year. And at 18, I kind of lived in uh, California, had this experience, but I was too afraid to go. So these are the kind of things that um, this experience really taught me and, and you know, and allowing myself to really uh, fall into this life and enjoy it. Do you have any other examples of how your mother showed you the future and then it happened? Yeah, so there was a, it was actually pretty interesting because she'd seen, it was probably 2008 uh, before she had passed away. She had, uh, had this experience uh, where she had said, I see you standing in front of people talking. Well, I'd already been a corporate trainer. Um, I'd already been, you know, spoken in front of people. But the other part of this is that she was walking around in the audience, um, you know, laying her hands on people in this dream that she was having. And then she also said, um, we're going to do something in uh, the uh, Indian reservation and uh, somebody that works for Indian Affairs is going to bring us out there. And so um, I was like, so she was constantly, she thought that we were going to end up working out in like New Mexico or Arizona or something along those lines. And, you know, the human, we get these, these dreams or these profound things, but we don't know exactly how it's going to unfold. So, well, that year I was on tour about six or seven months after she passed away, I was actually um, speaking on the Navajo reservation in Arizona. Um, my friend had uh, uh, ran a big Facebook group uh, that she was, and she was happened to be a nurse that worked for Indian Affairs and uh, out on the reservation in Arizona. And I remember I had said to her, I said, Michelle, what, um, I said, I told her my mother's dream from 2008. And she goes, 
I said, but mom used to think it was New Mexico. She goes, well, you probably remember this from history class, but Arizona used to be New Mexico and we're only about 10 miles from the New Mexico border. So it was, it, it was kind of interesting because um, she had said, she had told me an experience that she had with her sister, Vicki, and uh, about how she would, uh, she says, we're just going to keep the light on here, the lantern on here in, uh, um, in the reservation. And so we had about 400 people that came to that. We planned out, it was the first gathering of healers. Um, we had talked about it since my mother had passed away in January. And then Michelle didn't even start advertising it until July, the end of July. And I thought, this is not going to work out. You know, my ego was like, this is not going to work out. So um, we, we get there, um, and she starts advertising it. And there was people driving from Michigan. There was people flying in from Germany and Australia and all these kind of things. And it all happened in about three weeks. And it was just so beautiful in a sense. And so I'm up there speaking and I see this energy going and putting their hands on people's shoulders and on their head. And I thought, wow. And then I and I looked up and saw her, the outline of her face, and she looked right at me and smiled. And then I realized that when she had that dream, it wasn't that she was alive doing that. She was on the other side doing that. And then I said to her, I said, what are you doing? She goes, well, I told you I would be doing the work. I, I just didn't realize how it was going to be, how it was going to be. I thought I was going to be there with you. She goes, but I can do more good on this side than I can do on that side. And so a couple things here. She had talked about the connection with the person with Indian Affairs. She had talked about it being on the Indian Reservation, that we were going to do work there. We did do work there. Um, and it's when one of those things where I'm like, wow, that's that's pretty cool. And then here she is doing healing work. <laughs> but I've also had it where I've been teaching in my corporate classes. Um, where I've had her, uh, it's like it's it's like a light that comes in, and she places her hands on that person. Now I can't say attest to what they do, but they always, you know, the healing work that she was doing. But people always say when I teach that um, it's a very calming effect, and they feel like this uh, loving presence comes into the room. And you know, I'm generally a pretty calm person, so I can be that too. But it's just one of those things where I've had these experiences. And I didn't have that experience where I saw her other than on the reservation and then in, well, a couple times in classes. But then I was at a church uh, speaking um, probably about a year and a half ago. And I was at a little area called Casadega, Florida. And uh, so here she is in the audience. And I see her going around, placing her hands on people, um, you know, and, and doing her work. So it's just one of those things where that definitely happened. The other part about the lantern, she so she had told we had named our ministry the Lamplight Group because she had seen uh, these lanterns being lit across the world, and and that's just a metaphor for allowing people to step in their own empowerment, so to speak. And then so when my friend Michelle said we're going to leave the lantern out and the light on to call people in, I was like, wow, that's that's really that's really kind of cool. And it's not we always look at these as something mystical. But to me, it's just a metaphor to say, it's like what you're doing here on your show. You're helping to open people's eyes to something beyond what they were taught. And so that brings, clicks that eureka light bulb going off in front, inside of us and said, wow, there's more to this world than what we think. And so, and that's what awakening is all about, is awakening into the truth of who we are as beings. And there's a, just a lot more to us than what we said. Uh, we said. And so... Yeah, there's been, uh, that's just a few. I'd have to really start thinking about some of the ones where I've had uh, some experiences where she's uh, come to me in, in, in dreams. Well, I did have another, um, I was working with this, um, it was a grief counseling place and it was uh, um, it was called the Life Center in Tampa. And uh, I was, after Pulse happened in, uh, in Orlando, I had reached out to them and I said, uh, I was getting ready, I had reached out to Raymond and said, uh, I would like to interview you for the five stages of grief, which was different because most people I interview him about his near death experience and his work with that. But I knew he had, uh, he had taught this and did this as a psychiatrist and this connection with Elizabeth Kubler Ross, um, who had really started pointing that the five stages of grief. So I'd asked him to come on and, um, 
and do this video. And then I went to the director of the Life Center and asked them to do a, a short commercial for the Life Center to draw people in saying, we're here to help people who've lost people at Pulse and, and just come to us. Well, so probably about, we did, I did that video. It was out there for a while. It, you know, it, it, I hopefully it helped some people, but um, probably about three or four months later on my birthday, the director comes with a, uh, a painting of the Archangel Metatron <laughs> and said, I'd had a dream about your mother. And she had told me that um, you have an affinity for the Archangel Metatron. I said, that's interesting because it was always Michael. And now recently I've been studying uh, you know, Metatron and, and really trying to get to know that, that angel and stuff like that. And so, um, and I was actually wearing a, a Metatron's cube around my neck. <clears throat> and so it was just kind of a, a interesting phenomenon where I, I'd laugh and say, how many people can say that their mother passed away and gave them a Christmas present and a birthday present from the other side, but they can, um, I don't know if I would consider it influencing, but I would call it, um, uh, more of a, um, you know, they can go into people's dreams. And I think that they're probably going to into everybody's dreams. But A, our minds are so inundated with thoughts and anxiety and things that are going on that uh, we miss it. Or we have experiences where our loved ones are trying to connect with us and we're missing the things that are happening. And it's uh, it's not necessarily, and I don't say that as a blame game or anything like that. I say it as and that's why the the mass the uh, some, the people that are masters of meditation they say quiet your mind. That doesn't mean it's going to quiet down completely because the mind still controls the heart and it still controls the body and that kind of stuff. But you're quieting it enough to where you can start listening to those thoughts that come into your head and into your heart. And a lot of times that's um, you know spiritual energy that's trying to communicate with you, and they do it in pictures and thoughts and everything else and those other things that we're we're missing, you know, because we we chalk it up as I'm crazy, you know, or that, that couldn't possibly happen. What age does your mother appear to you as? So she appears to me now as a young younger woman, probably in their uh twenties or early thirties, um, fully healed, um, has no pain in her body. Um, my mother was a type two diabetic in life. And uh, she passed away at 54. So she was young when she passed away. I'm only, I'm going to return 50 in about six months. So she's, <laughs> I'm only a few years away from that. So to me, she appears young and healthy. So, and uh, I'm full of vitality. So, how often are you communicating with her? Not as much in the past few years. Um, until recently, uh, I was having a meditation the other day and I, and I was, I'm working on my next book and I'm, I'm doing it very corporate with my corporate background and all that kind of stuff. And I it was a meditation. She said, and I felt that had this feeling like, why don't you write about our experience we've had since I've been, I've been gone to the other side. Why don't you share with people so that they can heal and understand the things that, um, you have taught to you on the other side. And I've heard her, um, Recent, probably in the last two years, because I was going, you know, obviously it's been very stressful for everybody through the past couple of years. And um, I've heard her come out and say, you know, it's going to be okay, Jer. And uh, I've had her say to me, you remember when I said this when you were like 10 years old or 15 years old or 20 years old or whatever year? And uh, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, and I've heard her say, I've heard uh, her in my head say my full name, but I'm sure everybody's had their parents say their full their full name before. And it was more of like, it wasn't necessarily a disappointment, it was to kept, get my attention, you know, and she was just Jeremy Earl McDonald. And I was like, I started laughing, I was like, well, you're definitely saying the full name there. <laughs> but it's uh, one of those things where um, in the beginning for the person, three or four years, I would, I would talk to her and hear her all the time. But what I did learn too, is that we don't want their energy to be around us constantly unless we need them. So I will, um, if I need her, if I have a question or something that, uh, I feel that I need to have an ex, you know, have an ex answer for, then I'll, I'll start talking to her. You know, and I don't necessarily do any type of special ritual. I just start, Hey mom, you know, and they can come in just like this. They don't have, they're not like us. They don't have to have a 
GPS to get to us. They don't have to get in the car or anything like that. They're just connected to us. And so, but yeah, so I would say not like all the time anymore, but um, definitely on, on occasion. Your book is titled Peace Be Still. How did you come up with that title? Um, that was something that uh, my friend and, and my mother actually came up with. Uh, um, you've had my friend on your show, Virginia. And uh, um, then my mother had talked about it and they had said, why don't you call it Peace Be Still? Because it, the book is about me finding peace in my life. And so, um, in which anybody that reads it will find out that I, uh, even though I had a very good childhood with my mother, um, I had a family that wasn't necessarily, you know, typical dysfunctional family. Um, I was also raised in a church that was what I would refer to as a, as a cult. <laughs> so, but um, it was very damaging. Um, I'm not against churches. Uh, I speak at churches, but this particular one wasn't exactly great. Um, and so uh, I really, that's why, you know, I, I've, when they, they give me that suggestion, it resonated, peace be still. How do you find peace in your life when you've had all this stuff happen to you in your life, when you've had people break your heart, you've had people hurt you, betray you, that kind of stuff. You find, you, you know, you have to find peace in that. So that's what my book is all about, is the finding peace within your life. Well, I'm glad you brought up Virginia because I've had Virginia on a couple times and you and her are doing a webinar together. Can you yes. tell us about that? Yeah, so it's going to be on September 23rd at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I have a, a link uh, to um, share. You can come to my website, uh, storytellingalchemist.com, and just email me uh, through the website, or uh, you can find me on social media uh, and uh, just message me on social media and ask, and I'll just send you the, the, the sign-up form for it. I didn't do anything special or any type of website for it because it was, I really put this together pretty fast as a result of being a guest on, on your show. Um, but, uh, yeah, and, uh, we're, we're getting booked up with it. I was actually, uh, it's been kind of a joy putting this together and, uh, be able to connect with people. What are you going to be talking about at that webinar? So we're going to be talking about how to go inside of yourself and how to face that part of your world. So everybody always says, go inside to find the answers. Well, uh, we're going to start talking about how to do that how to face those inner demons or those uh, inner thoughts and discern through them and feel the energy and how to use that, what I was talking about, being in that ocean, you know, and going with the flow. It's not just a um, go with the flow and never act on anything, knowing when to act and having those discernments. So we're going to, I mean, it's only slated for two hours, so there's going to be a certain amount we're going to be able to do and answer questions, but uh it's uh, one of those things where we're also going to do a retreat in the, in, the, in the spring. And then I take people around different trips. I'm taking a group of people to Scotland and teaching them that, how to feel the energy and 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 go through there. So I, I, try, I like to do practical things uh, where I really just help people um, connect to that. So the webinar is going to be about us, you know, to a short amount of time teaching people how to go within and really have that sort of Do you have a YouTube channel? I do. It's under, and a lot of people have already seen it because of Virginia, <laughs> but it's a storytelling alchemist. Uh, if you look up storytelling alchemist and um, I'm going to give uh, Jeff my link, link tree. So you'll be able to find all my social medias as well. Well, if people want to ask you questions, how can they reach out to you if you're up for it? I would uh, go to my Facebook and uh, message me and go through the, that's in my link tree. Uh, or even my Instagram, and I will respond uh, through that. Um, give me a second to respond to them because <laughs> obviously I have other things going on, but I will, uh, I usually try to respond to everybody. And uh, so I would just go to my Facebook or my Instagram. If they want to find out more about the Scotland trip, do they go there as well? Yeah, so they can go there or it's mysticscotland.org. All right, well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yeah, just go out there, live your life, and live your life through the inspiration that is 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 uh, you have going on in your life, in your in your thoughts, in your heart. And why do I say that? It's because what it's, I realized that through this experience, I can hardly believe that whatever created this universe and this experience put us down here to be miserable. And and so and, and 
live in the now of the moment with your life. Don't worry about what other people are doing, and but live your life with joy and 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 in that moment and that now of the moment. And you, I guarantee you, you'll change your life. And so now, sometimes you're gonna do things foolishly because you're gonna be living in that now of the moment, but you'll learn from it, and that's okay too. And there's just a great world out there to experience and. That's one of the things that I learned from my experience of having, you know, my mother on the other side, but also, you know, missed opportunities of telling people how you feel and how they love them or care about them. Don't miss those opportunities because if you miss it and they're not here, then you never get that opportunity, at least in the physical sense. You can on a spiritual sense, but in the physical sense, you won't be able to. So my advice usually is just live in the style of the moment and enjoy. Jeremy, thank you for your message, and thank you for being my guest. Thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Well, the pleasure was all mine. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the Join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.